five, five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we just concluded last Sunday our series on spiritual priorities, and so we're going to do a few standalone messages over the next week because we are in preparation for Easter. Easter is just a few Sundays away. And what a great celebration Gracetown has usually on Easter Sunday morning. We do have a really special service planned that day, and uh, we will be starting a new series. So I was pondering and thinking and praying and uh, was thinking about what I would talk to you about today. And um, I got a thought this week. You know, sometimes I like reading the classics. Um, I find Ernest Hemingway quite interesting. What a troubled soul he was, um, but a brilliant writer. And one of his books uh, that's actually right by my bedside is called A Movable Feast. How many have ever read A Movable Feast? Two of us. <laughs> wow, so you all have an assignment this week to go read A Movable Feast. A Movable Feast is, is his memoir of when he was in, in the 1920s as a young aspiring writer where he lived in Paris and that was the place to be. If you were around in the 20s and you were an aspiring writer, living in Paris was the place to be. And Paris is quite interesting. Paris is quite romantic and we've been there and it's also quite dirty too. Um, but it's got some of the best bread stands in the world, it's got some of the most quaint, really neat, romantic cafes that I've ever been to. So I got this thought, and I'm going to talk to you about it today, because he actually stole that term from the church, from the liturgical calendar, or the church calendar. The church came up with that term, a movable feast, because... What it means this, most feasts have a fixed day, like, uh, 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 like Christmas, celebration of Christmas is December 25th every year. That doesn't change. But Easter is a movable celebration. It's a movable feast. It is something that it may fall on May 20 or March 26th this year and next year it may be April 3rd or something. So, but it's a movable feast. And so what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the ministry of Jesus in the form of a feast or a meal. And I'm going to show you some interesting things. And we're going to liken the church not to a temple, not to a building, but we're going to liken the church to a table and Jesus' ministry to a meal. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 29. In the English Standard Version, you can look in your notes, you can watch on the screens, and it says this. And people will come from the east and west, from the north and the south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. People are going to come from everywhere, and they're going to come and sit at the table with Jesus in the kingdom of God. And they're going to recline, they're going to chill. They're not going to be nervous, he said, they're going to recline at the table. So in the Gospels, we're going to, I'm going to show you that Jesus moves 
from meal to meal, from drink to drink, from feast to feast. And what he's doing is he's announcing and he's enacting the kingdom of God. And I'm going to show you that food matters. You're like, I knew I'm at the right place today. <laughs> food matters. Meals matter. Drinks matter. And what I want to show you that is our life at the table, at a meal, however mundane it is, it's sacred. It's sacramental. It means we are encountering the mystery of God. Here's what I know about eating and drinking, food and stuff. It connects people. It brings people together. There's nothing more like it. It brings families together. Many of us have many great memories of Thanksgivings of the past and Christmases of the past, not just with the gifts but the meals, the food, if you would come to the Yanok household, we're Hungarian, Slovak, and Irish, and English, and there's 17 conversations going on, and nobody's listening to anybody. <laughs> and we're all talking, and we're all eating, and it's, we're all laughing. It's a celebration. It's sacramental. It's sacred. And I've come to tell you that that's a spiritual thing. Everybody thinks we got to be spiritual, spiritual in church and sing songs, clap our hands, lift our hands, read a Bible verse. But sacramental things goes beyond that. But I want to tell you that when you connect with somebody and you begin to eat and you begin to drink and you begin to connect with them, it is sacred. So it connects. It actually turns strangers into friends. Have you noticed that? You meet somebody today, you're saying, hey, let's go out for lunch. You know, we just met. Yeah, let's, uh, you go out for lunch today and you eat together and all of a sudden, connection, cell phone numbers are exchanged. You follow each other on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, right? And you give your emails out and next thing you know, you're connecting, you're texting each other and you're building a relationship. Food and that, and that meal brings that together. So in the, in the Gospels, and three times in the Gospels, it says this, the Son of Man came. That's, those, those words are only found three times in the Gospels. And here's what it says in Mark 10, 45. It says, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life a ransom for many. Pretty interesting thing, right? Okay. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the other one, the second one. And then the third time it is said why he came, it's found in Luke 7, 34. And here's what it says. You're going to love this. For the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Can I get a Gracetown amen for that one? Come on. <laughs> Think about it. So, so the Son of Man has a purpose. The first two was purpose. Why he came. He came not to be served. He came to serve. Life isn't about you and I being served. Life is about you and I serving. Life is about how you and I can make a difference in somebody's life. How we can help them. And then the second thing, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is concerned and loves for those of us who get lost and can't find our way sometimes. He's compassionate and he's passionate about it. So that's what he's come to do. And this is the third one is how he does it. Now this messed with me. He did it by eating and drinking and inviting people to the table. Inviting people to his place, to, to a meal. It's incredible. If you look in the scriptures, Jesus' mission of evangelism and discipleship, ready for this? Was this, was sitting around a table with people. Was sitting around a table with anybody and everybody eating some grilled fish, a fresh loaf of bread, and a pitcher of some great wine. And that's how he began to disciple. And that's how he began to evangelize. He made it personal. He didn't make it professional. He made it connection. He made it relate. Let's connect. Let's, let, let's talk. Let's eat together. Let's drink together. Let's enjoy life together. Luke's gospel is actually full of stories of Jesus doing those two things. Let me show you. Luke 5. It says Jesus is sitting, eating a meal with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. Okay? Luke 7. 
Jesus is anointed at the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. Ready for this? Luke 9, Jesus then goes and feeds the 5,000, which was really, that was 5,000, and it was actually more than that. Luke, um, Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the teachers of the law at a meal. So he's rebuking somebody at a meal. He's eating. Luke 19, Jesus sees Zacchaeus and says, come down from that tree, you short fella. I'm going to go to your house and we're going to have dinner together today. Let me keep going. Luke 22. The next thing you see is Jesus and his disciples. Before he's going to be turned over to the Romans and beaten and scorned and a crown of thorns placed on his head and die, he's eating. He's eating. He's drinking. He's with his friends, his disciples. He's having a meal. And then once he is killed and he's buried and on the third day he rises again, guess what he does? He finds two disciples on the road to Emmaus and he's walked with them and he says, let's eat. Let's eat. What do they do? They go, they get to Emmaus, they go to a place, sit at a table, get the wine, get the bread, break it open. And before the bread hits the ground, Jesus is gone and those disciples go, we was just with Jesus and we didn't know it. How they figure it out? Because Jesus was always eating, right? Bear with me in this introduction. So he meets with them and then later... Once he, when he's resurrected too, the next thing he goes, he meets the other disciples and they're eating fish in Jerusalem. That's, to me, that is amazing. So Luke, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, he's at a meal, or he's coming from a meal. How many people like meals in this house today? Come on. How many people like to do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks? Right? And, 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 and what about the uh, uh, Frodo and his friends about eating second breakfast? <laughs> and some of us like second lunch and second dinner and second snacks, right? But there's something, there's something spiritual, there's something sacred about when people get together and eat and do that. Can, can, I, can I tell you, it's, it represents community. It represents a shared life. We have small groups going on right now that we're pushing for more. That when they get together, they're eating snacks. They're discussing life. They're praying for one another. They're watching a DVD. They are talking about the scriptures. But they're, they're sharing their life. I believe when we talk about these excessive meals, we're also talking about God's excessive grace, His excessive mission, and His excessive friendship with people. Some of my most memorable trips were not because I was on these trips, but it was because of who I was with. And, and, and uh, uh, I, I have fond memories of meals. Isn't that something we all, we all go, like, we, if, we, if you've been to a city, guess what we say? There is this restaurant there, right? There, oh, I can tell you a place where you can get the best sandwiches, right? We, we allocate our world with food. We really do. And so, like, I remember um, going to Paris. We had a group of young people with us, and we had flown nine hours from JFK. We're tired. We're hungry. And we get to the church where we were going to be ministering at, and they had prepared a meal. And so we had told them, okay, students, there's a meal being prepared. And I have learned, as much as I travel overseas, you eat everything. You do not say no. You don't go, ah, oh. and I have told, I can tell you, I have eaten things that you would probably pass out. I have eaten snake. I have eaten ostrich. I have eaten pigeon. I have eaten all that stuff because you just, that's the right thing to do. So I told, we told these students, you eat everything. Okay. So we get there and they did, we didn't know the custom in France, but all of a sudden we get there and they have cheeses. And I love, who likes cheese? They have all these cheeses there. And all this bread and a big bowl of corn. So everybody's just inhaling it. And, th and then we're all like, oh man, I'm full. And right when we leaned back and said we were full, we found out that was the first course. <laughs> that there was actually five courses. And we were dying. You know what I mean? Interesting. I remember going into Beijing, China. And being invited to a home of a family that I never met, never knew. 
but they wanted to serve us. And I remember going into their small little home in a, in a inner city area of Beijing, China, and not knowing what I was going to eat, not knowing what was going to be prepared before me. And, and, and they, they were so kind and so hospitable that the meal was wonderful, but the connection was even greater. That's what made it so sacred. Nearly one-fourth of the events in the Gospels occurs around a table. The healings, the miracles, the teachings, everything. He's enacting the kingdom. Jesus is doing what he is supposed to do. And the incredible thing is, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you here in a moment, Jesus welcomed everybody at the table. Not everybody is welcomed at the temple. That's why Jesus says today it's not about a temple. Today it's about a table. Eating and drinking with sinners, tax collectors, was the most controversial thing Jesus did, which was actually considered morally and ceremonially wrong and unclean by the religious sect of that day. Because they said, if you wanted to be holy, if you wanted to be right, that was only defined by what you ate and who you ate it with. That's why you see some of the old customary laws in Leviticus. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Don't wear this. Don't wear that. Don't go here. Don't go there. Okay? So because they said holiness was allocated to what you ate and who you were with. And so that was very highly controversial. And Jesus was highly controversial because he comes on the scene and he blows that out of the water. Jesus is not a fixed thing. He is a movable feast. The gospel is not stationary. It's movable. Mark 2, 15 through 17 says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not called the righteous, but sinners to repent. That's where he wanted to be. That's who he wanted to be connected with. Now, now watch this. The context of our opening scripture found in Luke that we read earlier, the reason why he said that was Jesus was actually asked a question. And I grew up in a denomination where we didn't ask the question. We knew what the answer was. Okay? Some of you may have grown up in a denomination where you thought you were the only ones going to heaven. Right? And everyone else was lost. But that was the question. How, Jesus, how many people will be saved? He didn't give them a number. He didn't even give them a percentage. Here's what he did talk to them about. Their salvation. He talked to them about them. And then he said this. To, and it was the Jewish people that he was talking to. Then he said this. You will be surprised. Hmm. You will be surprised who will be saved. He was telling them that because they felt they were the only ones because based on ethnicity, nationality, and culturally, they didn't think salvation belonged to anybody else. And Jesus comes on the scene and just messes that whole thing up. So what he does is he describes salvation as participation, not something that's acquired, something that you participate in, the kingdom of God. Look at Luke 13, 23 through 30. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? That's the question. And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter, will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, you begin to stand outside to the knock at the door, saying, Lord, open us, and he will answer, I don't know you. Come in. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in your streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, you, you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, here's what he says now. Behold, some are last will be first. And some are first will be last. 
He was trying to make that, that it's not all about them. We have taught from the beginning of our church at Gracetown. It, this Sunday morning experience is not just about us. It's about for the people who have not yet came and who will be coming and be visiting and being a part of this church. That's why we exist. That's why we exist. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he always used metaphors. He makes a statement. The kingdom of God is like, okay? Well, then he talks about the table. The kingdom of God is like a table. So the church is not to be just a temple, or a temple, the church is supposed to be a table. Let me say that again. It's not about the temple. It's about the table. Now, what are you saying, Rob? Are you saying we can't have a building to worship in? That's not what I'm saying. The focus has got to be about the relationship, the people, not a brick and the mortar. Watch, watch. See, in the temple... In the, in the New Testament, in the temple, and in the Old Testament, the temple was exclusive. Here's the facts. There were tons of restrictions, hierarchy, status conscious, enforced purity codes. Certain people were not allowed in the temple. If you're a woman, you're not allowed. Sorry, you're not welcomed. If you were not a Jewish person or you're a Gentile, you're not welcome. Sorry, keep your distance. You can stay out there. And when it came down to it, the only ones that were allowed in the tabernacle were the priest. And the only one allowed behind the veil into the presence of God or what they called the Holy of Holies was the high priest. Not even the other priests were allowed to go in. It's amazing that when David came on the scene, when he had the tabernacle, he opened up all sides. Moses' tabernacle, so many restrictions. David opened up all the sides of the entire tabernacle even the Holy of Holies, and it was open 24-7. And David, which it messed with everybody, welcomed everybody. He was a type of Jesus. It was a type of what the church in the 21st century was supposed to be. But the table is inclusive. When you see Jesus at the table, he says, pull up a chair. He says, I'm going to affirm you. This is a family. We had, we had uh, dinner in Romania, and it was family style. All this food, and there was this big round table, and there was a movable thing in the middle. And when you wanted something, you took the, thing, you, you took the table and you moved it. And that food that you wanted would take right there, and the next person would take it around. It's family style. Jesus is saying, I want my table to be affirming. I want my table to be family style. I want my, my table to be inclusive. I want my table. Here's another thing. He wants it to be a party. He wants it to be a celebration. And he basically says this. Everybody is welcomed. That's why at Jesus' table, you see women. You see sinners. You see tax collectors. You see all kinds of people. And you got the Pharisees and the hypocrites mad because Jesus is eating and drinking with all the wrong people in their eyes. And Jesus is basically saying, no, 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 no. They're the right ones. You're the wrong ones. If you think that way. You know, in Jewish culture in the Old Testament, there was the different feast. I used to travel and teach all over America on the, on the feasts of Israel and the tabernacle plan. And uh, it's a pretty fascinating thing that, you know, in the Old Testament, there, there are these traditions and their customs, and, but the feasts are all meals. I love how the Jewish people think, man, it's all about food, right? And watch this. But the tabernacle wasn't stationary. The tabernacle was movable. The tabernacle, Jesus was the example of the tabernacle. Matter of fact, in John 1, 14, and the word was tabernacled among us, was dwelt among us. That's the word tabernacle. And so Jesus was a movable feast. Jesus came on the scene and here's what he did. All the stuff that should have been going on in the temple for the help of people was actually Jesus doing it at the table. See, when a person sinned, if you sinned, anybody, you know, don't raise your hand. Okay. If you sinned, you were to go to the temple, take out your wallet, and based on your sin, you had to buy an animal. 
And, the, and, and if so, if you've got turtle doves, okay. But what about the guy who brings in a bull? <laughs> right? Or a goat. Or a bird. And then the pre, you'd, you'd give it to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice it on the brazen altar, take its blood, blah, 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 and their sins would be pushed ahead. That's, that, that's simple. That's, that's what you were supposed to do if you were a God-fearing person in the Old Testament and New Testament, okay? But Jesus comes and blows out all the water. They're sitting there eating food, drinking wine, and Jesus knows about what they're doing, and somebody says, well, you know, I messed up, I did this, and Jesus looks at them and doesn't say, well, for $15, go ahead into the temple and get, get yourself a bird and give it to the high priest and you'll be okay. No, no, you know what he says? He looks across the table at that person and he says, your sins are forgiven. What? What? Jesus, who do you think you are? You can't do that. Who gives you the right? You see what I'm saying? He's messing the whole system up. He's blowing the religious system of that day out of the water. And he's telling them, your sins are forgiven. During the week of before his death, he goes, and you'll see in the scriptures, he, he cleans out the temple. He reforms the table. I mean, he's just cleaning house. And the people are going, who is this Jesus? I'll tell you who he is. He's the incarnation of God. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. He's Emmanuel. God is with us. He's the holiest of all. He's the Son of God. Who is just Jesus? It's God sitting at the table. It's God sitting at the table. Who can eat with God? Everybody can eat with God. The misfits, the imperfect, people with indiscretions, people with struggles people who love him, people who don't know him, they all could be with him at the table. So the focus when Jesus comes along is, even though he observed the Passover, the feast of Passover, which is coming up, he said, now it's not a sacrificed lamb from Egypt, and we're looking back at Egypt. He said, now the focus point is going to be Good Friday. Because it's going to be Jesus, the Son of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what is happening here is the table is beginning to be open to everybody, unlike the temple. It's no longer fenced. You can have access to God anytime, anywhere, when you need him. That's what it's meant to be. Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man, and notice the word, receives. Receives sinners and eats with them. You mean I don't have to get good to get God? No. Come with all your mess. Come with all your madness. Come with all your indiscretions. Come with all your sin. And come to the table is what he is saying. There's a, I grew up in church and we had a, a song that I thought it was, I didn't like it. It wasn't one of my favorite. And it was, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude and turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Anybody ever hear that song before? Two of you. Three of you. Four of you. Okay. Yeah, I just so disconnected all of us right now, didn't I? Wow. But now I get it. Come and dine. He said, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Because that's all is required. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, just come to him. He'll fill you up. He'll make sure that your needs are met. I want to address several kinds of people that I think are here today. And some of us maybe struggled with the fact that we were accepted by God or not accepted by God. Our whole life maybe is a performance trap. Having to do this and have to do that to gain this person, that person. I like baseball and I'm reminded of the story I once read about Keith Hernandez, who was one of baseball's top players. How many heard of Keith Hernandez? 
great baseball player, batted an average of 300, won numerous Golden Glove awards, okay? He was excellent in fielding, uh, one of the highest average hitters in baseball, the most valuable player of award in his league a couple times, and even made it to the World Series. But he struggled. And something that was so important to him was that his father would not accept him. He could never get his dad's approval. And in an interview on ESPN, listen to what he had to say in this interview. He said this, one day Keith asked his father, said, Dad, I have a lifetime 300 batting average. What more do you want? And his father replied and looked at him, but he said, someday you're going to look back and said, I should have done better. And he said there was nothing he ever could do to be accepted by his dad. There was nothing he ever did, even as a grown man, that his father approved him. And sadly, it's many of us here today. Our grades were not good enough. Our job's not good enough. We don't make enough money. We don't have the best house or car or clothes. We don't play good enough. We're not skilled enough. Maybe we're too young. Maybe we're too old. And there's all these reasons. Maybe we made some mistakes. Maybe we sinned and we're being held captive by these things. We can't move on. We don't know what to do. Some of us may have tried to respond to God by coming to church and realize we come to church and we're still not good enough, right? Maybe we went to one church where we didn't wear the right clothes. You're not wearing the right clothes. What? And you feel like people didn't want you around. That you were invisible. Well, I've come to tell you, I know that sometimes church people can be notoriously judgmental, critical, and so condescending. I know that. I've been around it my entire life. Okay? But everybody's got stuff. Everybody's got things. And listen, when you come to Gracetown, you don't get that stuff here. We don't care who you are, where you're from, what you did, what's happening. We're just saying jump on in on the journey. We're a place that inspires hope and builds faith. So I want to tell you today this. Today Jesus is pursuing the imperfect. And aren't you glad he pursued you? Tap your neighbor and say, I'm so glad he pursued you. Here's why. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, 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 Eugene Peterson was a pastor, theologian, uh, seminary professor, best-selling author. And I've got many of his books. And I was reading one of them, and he makes this statement. And listen, just follow me for a second. Every congregation is a congregation of sinners. Period. And we all say, all the pastors say, amen, that's right. (laughs) But he doesn't stop there. As if that weren't bad enough, they all have sinners for pastors. (laughs) My pastor used to do this. (laughs) Remember Danny? Remember Brother Rose used to look down like this? I I used to act up in church, Steve. I used to talk. Matter of fact, every time I got spanked in school, it was because I was talking. And usually it was a blonde or a brunette. (laughs) And my dad witnessed all of them because he was my teacher. But I would be talking in church, and my pastor would stop preaching. Remember, Mom? He would stop preaching. And he would say, Robbie, are you finished? That's what my pastor used to do. Aren't you glad I don't do that to (laughs) y'all? Huh? Aren't you glad it's a new day? Huh? <laughs> Aren't you glad church is a little bit different? But that's true what he said. Luke 5, 31, 32. And Jesus answered them, those who are well need no physician, but those who are sick. I have not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Grace Town Church needs to be about a table, not about a temple. Let's go out and let's look for people who are not included and include them at Gracetown. I want to know if there's anybody who will help me do that. 
Let's go to the highways. Let's go to the streets. Let's go to our place of work. Let's go to our schools. And let's go reach for people and bring them back and invite them to the feast. Invite them for a meal at your house. Invite them to the meal at this church. We are feasting today at Gracetown Church. It's a meal. It's about a table. And I've come to tell you that Jesus says everybody is welcomed. I love that because Solomon would say this, let him, let him lead me to the banquet hall. Matter of fact, he said, for his banner over me is love. I look in Revelation. If you've ever read the book of Revelation, it's pretty, pretty wild. It's pretty historic, poetic, futuristic. But the last thing that happens in the book of Revelation is that we're eating. It's a meal. Read it. It's a huge meal. There's something about the table. Thou preparest, David said, a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies, and my cup runneth over. And he said, when my cup of wine or my cup of water runs over, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Church is to be about a meal. Church is to be about a table. Not about a function. Not about an event. It's about a shared experience with God. Jesus pursues the imperfect, for God showed his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And here is the gospel. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Because of grace, God is not holding anything against anyone. I just preached the gospel to you right now. I don't know what you're carrying, what you brought with yourself today. But by God's grace, he's not holding anything against you today. And he's welcoming you to his table. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We're, we're, I'm saying this because we're going to be celebration, celebrating Easter in a few weeks. The resurrection. And that's a message of hope. And if we are overwhelmed with grief and overwhelmed with despair and discouragement and condemnation, somebody needs to know that Jesus is welcoming you at his table. And he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. The call of salvation has always been, has always been, come, you are loved. Religion may have said, come and get right. And then God may consider loving you, but it's not. God loves imperfect people, burned out believers. So I want to challenge you today. I know this message was so different than how I normally teach and preach on a Sunday morning. But I want you to get this in your heart. Today, I, wanna, I want you to do this. I want you to place your trust, not in your ability to do good and to get yourself to to heaven but to put your trust in Christ put your faith in Christ in the story of the whisper test a lady by the name of Mary Ann Bird wrote something I want you to hear she said I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it she said I was born with a cleft palate and when I started school my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others a little girl with a mishappen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. And when this little girl, the schoolmates asked, what happened to your lip? I would tell them I had fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. And somehow, it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to be born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could love me. She said, there was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored. Her name was... Miss Leonard, she was short, round, happy, and a sparkling lady. She goes, annually, we'd have this hearing test. And Mrs. Leopard would give the test to everyone in the class, and finally she said it was my turn. I knew from the past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue. Or do you have new shoes? 
I waited there for those words, but I believe God had must, must have put some other words in her mouth because the seven words that she said to me utterly changed my life. So Miss Leonard is sitting at her desk and my hand is over my ear and this is what she said. I wish you were my little girl. He, she said, from that moment on, my confidence skyrocketed. I was accepted. I was approved. I was believed in. Changed that little girl's life forever. And listen to me closely today. God is saying to everybody in this room who don't have it all together, who have struggles, and who are on this journey this walk of faith, he's saying to us, you are my son. Listen, I did some crazy stuff when I was a teenager, but that didn't change my status with my parents. Now, I had to pay the price for some of those things, right? As we all did. But that my dad and mom didn't say, you did what? No, by the time Ron and I did something on the other side of town, by the time I got home, my parents already found our parents already found out about it. And they would say that, dude, could you believe Robbie did this? And my dad would say, Yeah. <laughs> you know, parents today would go, not my kid. Listen to me, mom and dad. Look at me right in the eye. Yeah, your kid. Believe it. Yes, your kid. But you know what they did? I would be disciplined. I would be corrected. And then I would be affirmed. You're still my son. I made my mom and dad cry a lot. I did. Made them cry a lot. And they would hug me and tell me they loved me. And I was. I never once figured if I do something again, they're going to ship me off to the orphanage. <laughs> That's how God is with us. He's got you. You are his son. You are his Daughter, this is so true. Jesus loves you. This you know, for the Bible tells you so. And then here's what I want you to tell. I want to tell you, God's power to save us is greater than our sin that condemns us. God's power to save is greater than the sin. Look what 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That means he's taken it as if he did it. Watch. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Folks, God won't take your sin just away from you. He'll remove it so far that you can't find it. That's how forgiven you will be. David said, as far as the east... It's from the West, so will he remove our transgressions. I want to encourage you today. It's a movable feast. Jesus will go with you, be with you. I want to encourage you as a grace towner to begin to invite people to your home and your lunches and your, your dinners and your breakfasts and begin to do life. That's the practical aspect of it. Share your life with people. But I'm telling you this, I want to share this church with this city. I want to tell this city, listen, we're going to make room. There's room for you. Remember that old song, there's room at the cross for you? Do you believe that? I believe that. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done, there is room. And I'm saying Gracetown needs to go back out and tell people there's a free meal. There's a meal where you'll be healed. There's a meal where you'll be reconciled. There's a, there's a feast happening that will bring you joy and peace that will change your life. So we're about to take communion together as a church. We do it the first Sunday of every month. I love this, this time. It represents a meal that Jesus had with his disciples. Just like a meal. But it was not what was just eaten that night, the bread, and what was drank, the wine. It was about what was being said that night and about what was about to happen because he was about to be, fulfill, to be the fulfillment 
of everything you've ever read in the Old Testament, Jesus was about to fulfill it all. And so we're going to stand. Would you stand with me? The, the word communion means having in common. It means a partnership. It means a fellowship that's recognized, a fellowship that is actually enjoyed. And communion is the two words that mean common and communication. And it implies being with somebody. That's why when we do communion, we do it together. We don't do it by ourselves. We do it with people. It's a celebration that does this. It binds us together. Like I said earlier, a meal brings you together. These young people took communion together this week at Love is Red. The experience of staying together, worshiping together, praying together, and eating together did something so spiritually significant. You may say, well, that's common, a meal, going to a church service. No, no, no. It goes beyond common. It's sacred. It's sacramental. The, the, the dinners, the lunches at the restaurant, that was just as sacred as the service. The church, the community of faith, is God saying this. This is God saying, I'm throwing a party. And everybody is welcome. Come on, drink some wine. Come on, have some bread. And he says this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So communion today is saying, you are welcomed. Come to the table. God is and always will be enough. I've asked Rusty to sing a song. And while he's singing, our custom is here that those of you who are over here, go out that side, come around, pick up your communion ware, and go back to your seat. Those of you who are in the middle, come this way. Those of you who are on that side, walk this way and around and grab your communion ware today. And so as Rusty sings, let us begin. We'll start from the back and work our way up front. God bless you. Yeah. 